listos, antes de comenzar quiero hacer un anuncio muy importante. Un par de anuncios. El primero, recuerden que esta charla será en inglés, si alguien necesita traducción simultánea, tenemos disponibles aparatos al fondo del de pasillo, ¿vale? So, this is, gonna be, this is gonna be in English, so I'll do my second announcement in English, and remember, I just want to rem thank everyone and remember every, everyone that we are a creative community. We have to be a respectful community. So I have two favors to ask all of you. The first one is that when we do the Q&A at the end of the session, please do questions. I know a lot of you want to express your love. I know a lot of you want to give him gifts, but this is a great opportunity. We have a creator, we have a producer, and we have to take this opportunity to pick his mind and we, so we can learn more from him, okay? And second of all, we do have prior commitments, so we won't have any kind of, at least for now, any kind of signing session at the end. However, if you want to give if you have any gifts for Alex, you can leave them here on the stage and we'll make sure, I promise, I personally promise, that we'll get them to him, okay? That said, please, I won't take any more time. We know why we're here. We know who he is. We know how talented he is, writing and voice acting. Creating, please welcome Alex Hirsch. Hola, Pixelado. Oh, that's, that's a lot of people. Oh my goodness, one second. I need to hydrate. Sorry. I ran up here real fast. Pixelado! <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, thank you all so much for coming out here. Um, I'm really grateful to be invited. I probably also have like tequila in my beard right now. One second. Let me wipe it off. There's going to be photographs. Um, I'm seeing some dipper hats in the crowd. Yes, yes, yes. Awesome. A Disney, like, I don't know if they're still making those, so congrats on finding them wherever they are. Um, somehow there's more Gravity Falls merchandise here in Guadalajara than in Los Angeles. Um, I found like these cool Gravity Falls backpacks. They're selling like right in the square out there. I just like bought a couple for myself. I was like, this is cool. <laughs> Disney does not understand all of this, um, but I do and I'm, I'm so grateful you're all here. So I'm, I'm only going to give a very short little talk um, because I've I've given a lot of talks. I've talked in Japan, I've talked in Russia, I've talked in other parts of Mexico, other parts of, of the world, and I tend to find that the most valuable thing I can do for creators and people starting out is answer your questions and, you know, say things that are relevant to your interests. So I'm gonna give you just a little talk about a few things that I've learned in my, in my time, and then I really wanna open it up to Q&A. That's like the main reason why I'm here. So uh, let's, let's see, I got a little PowerPoint. Here's a little drawing of me, sort of looks like a less tired version of me. <laughs> um, so, hola, pixelado. <laughs> uh, it's been a lot of fun being in here in Guadalajara. I have enjoyed the food. I have enjoyed the culture. <laughs> I have enjoyed the locals. <laughs> I, I, I don't know exactly what those things are. Uh, certainly like Donkey Kong and Homer Simpson. Um, <laughs> uh, so just a little introduction about myself. Um, here's some stuff I've worked on. I've been... <laughs> Uh, I've been a creator, I, I, I've been a producer, I do voices, I've, I've written on some books, I've been sort of an all-purpose, jack-of-all-trades, story, script, fix-it guy. Uh, I have friends and, and collaborators in Hollywood, and I tend to be the guy people go to when 
they're sort of stuck with structure on a story, um, especially in Act 2, they call me up and they say, what do I do? And I usually just say, cut lots of stuff. Um, that's basically all it takes to be a script doctor in Hollywood, um, but it takes some time to know what to cut. Um, I also do some voices you may be familiar with. Uh, I do all these guys on Gravity Falls. Everyone's favorite right here, the star. The breakout star of the series. Um, I also do some voices uh, on The Owl House. These guys you may be familiar with. <laughs> um, I would say that uh, Hootie is the, maybe the most difficult voice <laughs> I've ever had to do. We always save the Hootie lines for the end because like, like right now I'm like kind of my throat scratchy from like talking over crowds. Like, so it's like, like <laughs> it's like, it's hard. <laughs> um, uh, I've also just done various cameos on Star Versus, on Amphibia, on Rick and Morty, just lots of different voices. Uh, if any of you guys ever want a guy to do a weird, stupid voice, uh, you know, send me a message. I love doing it. It's so much easier than writing. <laughs> um, and of course, my best character of all time, Clamantha from Fish Hooks. <laughs> yeah, yeah! <laughs> we have some Fish Hooks fans in the house. Um, I will only be taking Clamantha related questions later. No, I'm just, just kidding. Um, all right, so uh, I'm sure some of you know this, some of you may not. It's been fucking 10 fucking years <laughs> since Gravity Falls premiered on the Disney Channel. That was 2012. As of this uh, June, it was, the show is officially old. <laughs> um, I'm very grateful beyond description and, and kind of in disbelief that people still remember and care about and rewatch and watch for the first time this show that was made like in the stone age. Um, you know, I think it's a testament to the hard work of our crew that it still seems like relatively contemporary. I hear it holds up okay. Uh, I'm sure there's stuff in there we would change. Um, but, you know, walking around this convention, I've had like a number of people come up to me and say, oh my God, Gravity Falls, like I grew up with it. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. They're like, yeah, I was nine. <laughs> I was seven when you were an adult making a cartoon and uh, that, that makes me feel like this. <laughs> Um, it, it's genuinely unbelievable to me. I think like a lot of people in animation, I have this kind of inner child that never dies. My twin sister can attest to that. She's here in the crowd, by the way. I won't tell you where, but everyone say hi, Ariel. Hi, Ariel. <laughs> now she's gonna hide and run away. <laughs> um, so, as a elder statesman of animation here, apparently, God, I, there was an article that literally described me as a veteran. I was like, wasn't I just like the new kid and now I'm the veteran? It will happen to you. Um, but in my time going from new kid to veteran, I have gained some wisdom. I have gained some back pain. Um, I'm here to share both of those with you guys. Uh, so I think since we don't have a lot of time, I just want to hit you with the big topics right here and maybe talk about, does anyone want to know the secrets of success in animation? Does anyone want to know? <laughs> you don't want to succeed in animation? <laughs> All right, I have four little secrets that have helped me. Um, I'm going to start with one that you don't usually hear at these talks. It's kind of a complex subject, and there may be some follow-up questions, but I think it's very important, and I think you'll understand why. The first secret to success in animation, in my experience, everybody's got a different experience, but this is what I've experienced, is to know your value. This is not necessarily obvious. Let me explain what I mean by this. Um, you know, I, I came into this industry just like all of you, going to talks, going to school, making my own short films I put online, and I felt so tiny and insignificant when I would look at the industry. I'd see these enormous companies, Cartoon Network, Disney, Nickelodeon, and I'd think, how could a little, tiny, insignificant nobody like me ever matter to these companies? And I'll say, after working for many of these companies, they want, some of them, they kind of want you to feel that way. They want you to think that you really, really need them and that they're really, really powerful and that you could do, you would do anything in your life to work for them. So, you know, to me as a kid growing up, animation companies looked like this. <laughs> this is what I saw when the recruiters would come to CalArts. They seemed like these 20 foot tall gods. I, I, I felt like I was, you know, looking up to them. This is a, just a generic mouse related company. It could be any company. <laughs> This is a metaphor. Um, here's the thing that all of you need to understand, is that if you, um, 
if you, if you just blew all that importance away, what you would see is that these companies are built on your ideas, your work, your time, your sanity? <laughs> Artists made those movies. Your favorite movies, your favorite TV shows, you know the names of the creators sometimes. You always know the names of the studio, but you don't always know the names of these artists because you know the big studio. And when you start at these companies, you know, oftentimes they kind of use that to you know, shortchange you, they'll make you wait a long time. Um, it's important that you remember that everything you love comes from artists. And these companies, you know, I know it's a tumultuous time in the industry right now, things are getting canceled, shows are falling apart, networks are changing, it's all tectonic, and it can look like, how can I survive out here? But if all of this was missing, if artists' ideas, artists' work, artists' time, and yes, artists' brains were not out there, these companies would fall apart. He's just a little mouse, guys. <laughs> he needs you, um, and, he needs, and he needs to make money. Um, we'll touch more on this later. All right, number one, know your value. We are the lifeblood of this industry. They need us. So make sure that it's a positive reciprocal relationship. Uh, piece of advice number two, defeat fear. <laughs> what do I mean by this? Some of you in the crowd may know what I mean. If not, you'll know in a second. Um, I've been working apparently in this industry for a long time, and I can remember back as an art student coming into school, my knees trembling, my knuckles white. I didn't want to show anyone my sketchbook. I was scared to turn in a film. Um, no matter who you are, no matter how good you are, fear will come for you. <laughs> I apologize. Some of you might be feeling it in the crowd. I'll be honest, I'm feeling a little tiny bit right now. It's normal. It's natural. Um, but it's not always obvious what counts as fear. Uh, I've learned in my time talking to many people and interacting in many contexts that fear, um, fear actually has a lot of different faces. Um, <laughs> take a look at this. Procrastination, perfectionism, being a giant hater and complaining about everything and never making anything yourself, massive, massive ego. They seem like different things, they're all one thing. Those are all fear. Those are all somebody who wants to create, but maybe they're scared they're not good enough so they don't want to start. Or because they're scared they're not good enough, they don't want to finish. They become a perfectionist. Or they secretly think they've got the goods, but um, it's so much easier just to say how much everything else sucks. So they spend all their time just criticizing. And criticism is totally OK. It's totally important. Um, but if you just criticize, I mean, I can't tell you the amount of people I know. <laughs> Some in the industry, I won't name names, everyone means well, who are incredibly talented, writers and artists, and I say to them, well, when are you gonna pitch your idea? And they say, psh, no one will ever green light it, this industry sucks, they're all stupid, see all the dumb stuff they're green lighting, they'll never pick up my genius idea, so I will never pitch it. <laughs> right, procrastination, perfectionism, it's all connected. Um, you know, I have one story I can tell about a friend of mine, we came out of college and I don't know how, but she seemed like one of the most fearless people I had ever met. Um, she was not scared of failing, and she just started pitching and pitching and pitching and pitching. And then she'd come back to me and I'd say, how'd the pitch go? And she'd smile and she'd say, they hated it. <laughs> and I'd say, oh, how do you feel? And she's like, well, I guess that idea wasn't connecting. Let me try another one. Um, and she probably pitched like six shows, and on her sixth show, Disney's like, all right, have Star versus the Force of the Evil, and it was greenlit. Boom. <laughs> um, I can describe multiple other friends who have a similar experience. I mean, uh, my, my old pal, uh, I had another friend who was pitching shows for a decade, and every time they said no, he'd pitch another one, and finally Rick and Morty got greenlit. Imagine if he had said, oh, geez, they didn't like my first idea, I give up. Oh, geez, I'm going to walk into the ocean, everyone sucks. So many talented people get stuck in the hydra right here, and they never get out of these waters. They just get trapped in it. Um, and it's, it gets sadder the more you do it and the longer you do it. I mean, gosh, there's another talented writer I know. Again, I won't name names. He's so good, but all he does is, all he does is just write negative criticism on the internet of all the movies and all the shows. And again, fine, that's valid, that's fair. But he could be writing. He could be writing. So, this is why, in a microcosm, I'd say the best way generally to defeat fear is I just Googled the word inspiration and this came up. <laughs> There's a lot of tricks to defeating this, but in my personal experience, 
Inspiration is the number one, number one go-to to make you forget about your fear. Um, I had two different animation professors in college. One of them ruled with fear. He would say to us, none of you are good enough. None of you are gonna make it into the industry. You'll be delivering my pizza one day while I'm working on animated movies. I won't say who he was. <laughs> um, and you know, there, there were some students who like, kind of they were masochists. They were like, yeah, yeah. Criticize me, senpai, and it was <laughs> weird. Um, but I, me, personally, it, it made me shrink. It made me frightened to share my work. And when you're frightened to share your work, you're not going to finish anything. And then I had another teacher my second year. Every day, the first thing he would do is he would come in and he'd just say, hey, I just snuck a bunch of concept art out of the studios I'm working for. Don't tell anyone. Want to look at the coolest design you've ever seen. Um, and he would show us clips from his favorite movies. He'd show us clips from music videos. He'd show us clips from life, the stuff that excited him the most. And when I was sitting in that class, my fear melted away. And I walked out, and I could not wait to race to my desk and just see what happened. I wasn't procrastinating. It didn't have to be perfect. I wasn't, I wasn't worried about what other people were thinking, and I didn't even remember that I was there because I was excited about what I was going to create. Um, inspira inspiration, that's the dude. That's my number one. You have to have a little bit of fear. I'd say, here's my proportion. <laughs> if you're totally fearless, you might just like wander out of the forest and get eaten by a bear. So you need a little bit of fear. You know, the old f f phrase is you want fear behind you, moving you forward, not in front of you, blocking you. So have a little bit of healthy fear, have doubts, but fill your time. Look at your time. Ask yourself, how much of my time is spent criticizing, delaying, and how much of my time is spent watching, absorbing, and creating? Just that alone, that could save, that could save your whole animation universe. Um, another one. This is very, 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 very important. <laughs> I can't stress this enough. Um, listen to your friends. No, every creator is a communicator, is a storyteller. What happens to a story if you whisper it into the desert and no one's there? Does it even exist? Do you know if it exists? You know, even the best artists, even the most avant-garde, even the most off on an ivory tower, secretly, they want people to actually like and relate and react to the stuff they make. Um, there's a lot of different forms this takes. One of them was uh, at CalArts, where I went to college, um, we would have an open show at the end of the year. And what that meant was every student had to create a film every year. Every year you had to create a film, so we've got four films by the, end of the, by the end of the school experience. Or more if you're ambitious and crazy, like me and my friend Adrian Molina was. Shout out to Adrian Molina, director of Coco. Uh, his new movie just got announced at D23, but we don't need D23. We're at Pixelotl! <laughs> Um, and me and Adrian, what we did when we were at CalArts is we would go to the open show and we'd watch every single student film, and then we would listen. We'd listen to the crowd. We'd listen to what makes people gasp, what makes people cheer, what makes people laugh. If your film isn't doing those things, your film could be better. Doesn't mean it's not good, but it could be better, and you won't know until you listen. You won't know until you take your script to your friend or your enemy, <laughs> anybody. Now, it doesn't mean listen to every single thing every other person says, because some people have very narrow perspectives, but when I was working on Gravity Falls, <laughs> this is a little time machine here. This was the day Gravity Falls was greenlit. <laughs> I look like a Cabbage Patch Kid that somebody just glued hair onto. <laughs> look how shiny, look how shiny I am. <laughs> What's that guy's skincare routine? Um, I had no idea what the hell I was doing. Uh, I would have just fallen apart and just imploded if I didn't have artist friends who I'd been knowing and cultivating. I want you guys to all do something for me real quick. I want you to look to your left. Fine, do the opposite now, look to your right. These people, there are future superstars in here. Okay? You, the one swiveling your head, might be one of them. You might be looking at one to your left and to your right. Um, it's really important that you be really nice and welcoming and kind and supportive and empathetic to each other. One, to be a good person, and two, for evil, selfish reasons, because they might be your boss one day. <laughs> And it would be nice if they liked you and hired you, or if you all got shows picked up and then you did crossovers on each other's shows. 
I, I'm living proof of what happens when you make a lot of really, really good and talented friends. They make you better, you make them better. It's wonderful to rise up together. You can't do that if you're just completely on your own. Now, that doesn't mean you have to be in art school. It doesn't mean you have to be at a convention. It can be online. We, we didn't have the internet the way we have it now. It could, be your, it could be your mutuals on Tumblr or Instagram or Twitter or TikTok or your WhatsApp threads, whatever it is. Wherever you find people who you have similar interests and, and you can show them something you make and you'll say, I know it's stupid, I know it sucks, but what do you think? <laughs> and if they're a real friend, they'll say, this part is stupid and sucks. <laughs> That's the best thing you could possibly hear because it tells you which part to fix. This is free. It, like, like advice from friends is free and it can make your things so, so much better. I know so many projects that were like, they're okay. And all they needed was a big audience pass, a test screening, and then some notes. And the creator said, no, I'm a genius. I don't want to look at the notes. I'm a genius. I don't want to look at the notes. I'm a genius. I don't want to look at the notes. Those things never come out as good. I'm telling you from experience. Um, I had no idea what I was doing, <laughs> if you could believe such a thing. I needed these people, my crew, um, all bonded very quickly. There's a, here's, a, here's a little fellow named Matthew Brawley. I don't know if you've ever heard of Amphibia. Here, here's Michael Rihanna, went on to direct Mitchells vs. the Machines. Um, every person here has worked on awesome things because they're hard, hard working and because they connect with other people. They don't retreat into that fear hole. You can't make these friends if you're in the fear hole. So watch out for it. Um, and like I said, I want this to be a very quick talk. So I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you the big one, the most important secret. This is number one. This is all the other ones you can forget about them if you focus on this one. But do, do, do make friends. Please, please make friends. <laughs> it's good for you. Um, I'll tell you what it is, but first I'll talk a little bit about it. When I went to school, I felt like this guy right here, this, this little dough man, and, and I had this vision of what success looked like, right? And I, and I compared myself to other people I thought were successful, and I looked over there, I said, how do I get there? How, how the, and you can see how determined he is, look at those eyebrows. This drawing took hours, guys. <laughs> um, how do you get there? How do you get over this chasm? Um, well, one thing you don't do is all the things we talked about on the fear hydra. You don't say, I'll do it tomorrow. Tomorrow might come. Another tomorrow might come. You grow a long beard, you die. You never get there. You don't say, I'm going to wait until it's perfect. Same thing, beard, death, don't do that. Um, you don't go on Twitter and say, the industry is so screwed up that I'll never make anything. I give up. I I'm giving up in protest because I'm so smart. <laughs> How are you going to get there? It feels good in the moment. It's validating, but it's not going to get you there. So the first step, this isn't the whole thing, guys, but try. <laughs> That's the first thing. Now, here's the cool part. If you were an actual fella, little guy, little, little, little fella over here, and you were jumping into a chasm, you would die and that would be over. And that happens a lot when you try. That's constant. Here's the cool thing about art, is that it's, it's, it's made up. So that means you make it something, you fail, it sucks, you respawn. You could, you could go again. You know, your ego is a little bruised, but what is ego? It's a story you tell yourself. You, you, you can't weigh it. You can't point to it. It's invisible. It's just in your head. And if you can have the courage and inspiration, say, all right, fuck it. Respawn, try again. Go. You will fail again. <laughs> and you will respawn again. And you will try again. And you will fail again. I think you guys can see where this is going. That probably sounds kind of scary, but it's sort of exhilarating. Uh, I'm not recommending you jump off a literal cliff. This is a metaphor. I hope the translator is doing a good job for anyone who doesn't speak English. <laughs> um, but here's the thing. If you kind of start liking it, if you're like, oh boy, I woke up. I can't wait to see how I failed today. Last time I failed this way, this time I failed this way. And you remember everything, <laughs> something will happen. All, all the corpses of your previous failures will start to pile up. They'll start to fill the chasm, and you'll realize that your past failures, suddenly one day you just walk on top of them. <laughs> Every single one of those had something to teach you. And now, like a character in a video game who's just died and respawned and died and respawned, suddenly you play that last boss, and it's like your fingers are moving on their own, 
and it just beats itself. And you're like, why was that so hard a week ago? We all experience that in microcosm with a, a, a new friendship or, or with a video game. But with something as big as your career, with something as big as art, with something as big as writing a script or making a show, you know, it, it can just seem like that chasm's too far and you'll never recover. Um, but but you, 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 you do recover. Um, you know, if you take good enough care of your health and if you've got a, enough of a support system, you can survive making something that sucks. Everyone does it. Some of the best directors, some of your favorite directors have made garbage movies. It's not their fault. And it's cool that they did that. Um, I feel like, I'm trying to think of a, big, a director who's big enough that I won't get in trouble for saying it. All right, I'll say it, I won't name specifics. I think the Coen brothers are some of the greatest directors of all time. And some of their movies are 90% on Rotten Tomatoes and some of them are 10%. And do the Coen brothers just say, I give up, no. They just say, look, fuck it, I'm just gonna do this now. I'm gonna, they just keep going. And as a result, they've got like more movies than so many directors, and so many of them are awesome. And like an awesome one, and a weird one, and a cool one, and a bad one, and then an amazing one, and they just, they don't stop. If, if anybody in the fat cr crowd is a Coen Brothers apologist and thinks I'm saying heresy, you're welcome to your opinion. But I'm sure you know someone who sometimes does good and sometimes does bad, and that's okay. You know, something that happens with internet, like fan communities that I see sometimes, and bless them, I love them, but sometimes there's this, <laughs> there's this reaction to when a creator fails where they just tear that creator apart. They say the creator's lazy, or um, the creator is an idiot, or they've lost their talent, or they were a hack all along. Um, I don't know where that narrative comes from. Uh, I think maybe people who perceive that, maybe they feel a little hurt, they love this work, and then when they see it not to be so bad, they're hurt and they're lashing out. It's a kind of relationship you have with your favorite creators, and when they miss the mark, it feels hurtful and, and you say, fuck you. But if you're gonna be a creator, you, you gotta not engage in that, it, that's a trap. Um, most creators, particularly in animation, my God, any show that you like say to yourself, your friends like, this is dumb, this, those, those artists are working hard, those writers are working hard, there's nobody out there who isn't giving it their all. And sometimes they fail, and that's good, because look, look where it'll eventually take you, right? I know this from experience. Gravity Falls was my first show and it did succeed. So you could say like, Alex, what are you talking about? Your first jump over the thing, it worked. Not at all. What you don't see is that every single script on Gravity Falls, pile of corpses of previous drafts that sucked so bad. And I would go to my crew and we'd read the scripts every episode. The great ones, the ones that are so-so, every episode. We worked equally hard, and I, put my art, I brought my artists around a table, we read the script together, we all did the voices, we got into it, and then I'd say, guys, tell me which part isn't working. And everyone would be super quiet because I'm the boss and it's intimidating, and they're worried that maybe what they think is stupid, or, or they just start thinking about lunch. And so then I go around the table and I say, all right, you, what's the bad part? You, what's the bad part? I don't let them leave until they just give me one thing they would change and one thing they would save, because if, Nine out of 10 of them said, yeah, the second half of the second act was confusing. It's true. I've learned something true because I listened to my friends and that failure gives me a chance to do another draft, another draft, and finally get my bridge to success. Now, um, I went to this school called CalArts. CalArts has kind of got this weird reputation. People think of it as sort of this like elitist mafia and fair enough, it costs way too much. Fuck that tuition. Um, <laughs> There's some CalArts guy who's so mad at me right now. Um, they're always sending me emails like, donate to the school. I'm like, I donated for four years, bitch. <laughs> Have you heard of student loans? What are you talking about? I served my time. Um, but I, am, I, 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 am, I, I do serve on the board of CISA, which is their free summer program, because that's awesome. Um, but the, 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 the point I'm making is that CalArts does one special thing, which any school can do. It's not unique to LA, and that's, they just make you, like I said earlier, they make you make a film every year. Instead of waiting four years to make one film, you've made four films by the end, which means you've got more corpses in your corpse canyon. I apologize if some of you have a fear of corpse canyons. <laughs> and so I think that's a big part of some of the success of the school is just that those students have been forced to make more stuff and so by the time they graduate, now it doesn't mean you have to go there. You can go, no, you can go to no school, you can be online, you can make your context, you can fearlessly get inspired, and you can just start making. Make comics, make scripts, show them to your friends, jump into the gorge, and you can get there without paying a dime to one of these colleges. I had a wonderful time. My college experience was great. I'm just saying all those roads, are, all those roads look different, but they all follow the same process of trying and failing and not being scared of to fail and, and being allowed to get criticism and being excited about criticism. Think of it as a game, because you will not die if your thing is bad. You will not. 
I've made bad things, I didn't die, here I am. <laughs> I've survived. So fail early, fail often, and you get, the, you get the shiny thing. Yeah, yeah. Everyone wants to be that little dough blob. Uh, so success equals failure. Uh, in one episode of Gravity Falls, there's a character named Rumble McSkirmish, and he would say, winners, don't lose. He's wrong. Don't listen to Rumble. Winners absolutely lose. It's part of the process. It's part of being great. Those are just a few little tips. Chew on them, swirl them around. Some of them are super obvious. I even need to remind myself this stuff. It's a life lifelong process. All of us have fear. All of us have ego. All of us get scared. All of us get overwhelmed. Um, but it's supposed to be fun. And it can be fun if you treat it like a game, if you come every day optimistic for something new, and if you keep watching new and different things, if it, you know, listen to different music styles, watch different types of movies, read different types of books. Some of them will be lame and you'll be like, why did I do this? And some of them will blow your mind and turn you into the artist you were always meant to be. That's my little conversation. Let's do a Q&A, let's chat. <laughs> One more of these facing the firing squad. All right, I gotta go to the puppet grunkle stand. <laughs> if you guys don't see, there's a, a grunkle puppet, it's amazing. Hold it high. Hello, everyone! I'm a puppet, I got little wiggly arms. All right, puppet stand, hit me. Uh, first of all, I love you, I love Gravity Falls. You are uh, my biggest experience for for half, for half my own series in the future, but my question is for you, what was your experience working with Disney? Would you recommend it or, <laughs> or are, are you asking me to badmouth a corporation? Yeah. No, 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 look, I'm gonna, let's be real here, like Asking someone what their opinion of, of Disney is is sort of like asking someone what their opinion of like an entire hemisphere of the planet is. Like the company is gigantic, it employs 100,000 people, makes billions of dollars, and every department, they don't talk to each other, so my experience 10 years ago in one little department could be completely different from someone else's experience, and all those experiences are valid. Um, I, I would say this, companies are not people. Um, people have souls. <laughs> uh, companies have one job, and that's to make money and get bigger. And if you can help them make money and get bigger, they'll, they'll let you hang out. They'll throw some of the money to you. Um, I don't know if any of you guys saw Spirited Away. Um, you'll remember there was that blob, No Face. And uh, he would, when people would dance around him and worship him, he'd throw him little bits of gold. Right? And then you'd get bigger and bigger. That's a company. That's what companies are. <laughs> and it's cool. Like, dance, get your gold, and then protect yourself. Because if you start thinking of them as your friend, or if you start thinking of them as this amazing thing, they're just a flawed system made up of people that has no brain and wants money. And sometimes they'll make good decisions, and sometimes they'll make bad decisions. And the bosses are always changing. So it, you really have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis. I'd say companies are not good. They're not evil. They just have different priorities than us, and they will absolutely throw us in the meat grinder if it helps them, and they'll absolutely make all our dreams come true if it helps them. Um, so, you know, I, I think you just, if you're gonna work with a big company, and sometimes you need to, because No Face is throwing out the gold, where are you gonna get the gold nuggets? Um, just be careful. Um, like I said, know your worth. Uh, be willing to walk away if they ask something of you that, that you don't respect. Um, and if you can't walk away because you need that gold, you know, just be nice to everybody and wait your turn and maybe eventually you'll be riding on the back of no face and then you can decide who he eats. <laughs> um, but you know, me personally, like, I'm very grateful. Like Disney gave me this opportunity and the executives, the creative executives, they were wonderful. The creative executives, they just said like, yeah, go, keep going. They, they could tell we were making something good. The standards and practices department, I have no respect for them and I won't talk about them. Um, <laughs> But all oh, those guys are fired by now, it's a new team. Anyway, um, all right, next question. Hi, uh, can you hear me? 
Oh, yes. Yeah. I okay. love the shirt. I think I have that exact same shirt. <laughs> Thank we you. Could, we could it's be doppelgangers. <laughs> it's from my dad. Uh, I wanted to ask something in regard to perfection means, which was your second slide, I think. Uh, I have been delaying a pilot of mine for an action animated series. Uh, with being it an animatic with some voice acting and very basic animation, do you think that is enough to show what potential the show could have and my potential as director or showrunner? I'm sorry, it's a little echoey in here. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, may I repeat it? Or? What's, yeah, just ask the question in the simplest form possible. Okay. Uh, do you think an animatic is enough to show my, the potential for a show in a pilot? An animatic, like the most basic version of animation. Oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm so far away. Maybe, um, is, are, do you speak Spanish? Um, sí, do you think you could speak to him real quick? Oh, or do you know? Oh, perfect. Is an animatic enough to show people to test your project, right? Is that the question? Okay, great. I apologize. Bad ears. I'm old. I'm a veteran in animation, apparently. <laughs> um, I love that question. L let me answer that in a few different ways. Um, Something that I'm always looking for when I'm on a project is what we call a provable moment. That means a moment where you can do what I said, where you can test it in front of other people. Um, I think in a traditional pipeline, like a cartoon made with a script, there's multiple provable moments. Now, the reason Bibles are so hard to make is they're not provable. Even if you read a really good Bible, you don't know if it's going to be a good show. You just don't know because it's not a show. It's a stack of papers. In my experience, there's a few provable moments. The first provable moment, if you work with scripts, is the script. You can, trust me, I've read so many scripts where people have sent me scripts, and a lot of, like, it's so hard to write a good script that you might read a few scripts and think, well, you can't tell with the script. But trust me, when a script is working, it sparkles. Something about it comes alive. If you send your script to your friends, and they say, oh, I haven't had time to finish it. Oh, uh, I got COVID again. They got bored in the first three pages, and they didn't want to tell you. Um, but if your friend says, oh my gosh, that was great, I, I can think of more stories, that means your script is working. So the script is a provable moment. And that's why I really, really put my effort into the scripts on Gravity Falls. The next provable moment is the storyboards. If you could pitch a storyboard to a crowd or a few friends, and they laugh at the funny parts, and some parts are checking their phone, and you know that's what to cut, that says, okay, it's provable. An animatic is great. You know, obviously there's some executives who don't understand animation, but most at this point, they get it. And I've shown animatics, and I've been in uh, movie screenings where they've shown animatics that are, you know, totally black and white, sometimes really rough. And animation can add a lot, but you can tell. You can tell if it's working. So I think it's so much better. If you've got two choices, if you have a choice between showing a, a producer, an executive, a tight, funny, or dramatic, or successful, good, entertaining animatic, or like, you know, 30 seconds of beautiful animation, show them that animatic. Because those are honestly rarer. Um, I, I would say absolutely go for it. Um, and uh, we, I, I, yeah, I mean, like, I, I'd work on Spider-Verse, I did work on Mitchell's, and like both of those movies had dark days where the animatic wasn't working, and then amazing days where suddenly a scene clicked. You can tell. Uh, so I'd say yes, absolutely. All right, next question. Who's got the, who's got the mic? Who's in um, charge? Okay. Over here to your right, I think. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Um, hi, Alex. I just wanted to know, um, oh, ignoring Disney, like, will not mention Disney, but regarding a post you made in your Twitter um, about all the times, uh, let's say, higher-ups came up to you and were like, you know what, regarding Gravity Falls, we can't have um, Mabel say poop or, I don't know, we can't punch sure. a kid. But I guess at some point you have to go, you know what, I, I got to put my foot down because it's my... It's no longer my story if I change this so much. So how was that? Yeah, um, I mean, <laughs> you know, I, some of you may have seen this. On, on the 10th anniversary of Gravity Falls, I was looking for something fun for the fans. Because I'm an entertainer and I like to make people have a good time. Um, and I was out of fun things. The show's been over for a long time. There's no new stuff to show or reveal. But it occurred to me, I remembered that uh, at our rap party for the series when it was over, uh, we did a dramatic reading of these S&P emails, some of the funniest ones. And everybody had, got a kick out of it. The executives got a kick out of it. It was a good time, so I figured I'd upload it. Uh, and I didn't expect it to go like viral. It's got like 10 million views or something. Like... James Gunn and Shonda Rhimes were replying to it, and I was, I was like, oh God, this is getting gigantic. Um, and it's because it's, 
On social media, when something blows up, you imagine it was written in a shout, but everything is written like this, and then something's blow up, and you're like, why did you shout that? And you're like, I whispered it, but then everyone turned it into a shout. So it makes it seem like I'm like really angry or bitter, or I got an ax to grind, and it's like, it's fine. It's water under the bridge. Like, I, I would say that um, I had a really, how do I put this? I really, really cared about making something that I liked as an audience. Um, I think if you're an entertainer, and that's maybe different from being an artist, I don't know if I'm necessarily an artist, but I know I'm an entertainer, and I know what an entertainer does, which is they make something they know entertains. And when we would get notes that diminish the drama, or diminish the comedy, or diminish the clarity, you know, I, I would tend to push back. Um, some of them, lots of them, I said, fine, have it. And I didn't post those in that Twitter. So it looks like all I did was say no every time. Um, but there's plenty of things I said, sure, it's not worth it, okay. And there's plenty of those where I lost. Um, but I think if you're making something, you have to ask yourself, what is it I love about this? Um, and for me, sometimes we would get notes where they'd say, you know, Make it less funny or make it less scary. And I say the whole point of the show is to be funny scary. You could call it the funny scary hour. You could change the name from Gravity Falls to the funny scary hour, but you can't make it less funny and less scary because then why am I here? Um, so I, I really, I would push back on the things that I thought were the most important. And sometimes I would push back on things that I didn't think were important, but I was trying to establish a precedent. So if they say today, you know, you can't say, um, you can't say demonic, and then I, and I'm like, okay, that's not important to this episode. But then later we do a demonic episode. They say, we, we remember you agreed not to say demonic. You're like, ah, crap. So a lot of those were preemptive notes. Even though sometimes I wouldn't win, I'd say like, look, this is why I sold the show. This is what matters to me. Um, and a lot of times the episodes that got the most notes, scarier episodes, I'll talk to like a six-year-old and they'll be like, I like the part where the old man's face was rearranged by the demon from the sky. <laughs> Like, they're not crying, they love it. Um, so I don't know, I, I, I feel like our team was uniquely out of touch. Some teams are better than our team. That's a comedic time capsule, not necessarily meant to be something to emulate. All right, next question. Hi, here in the back. <laughs> Over here, hi. Um, thank you for being here, thank you for everything you've done. Huge fans. Uh, our question is, me and my friends, we're working on a very big project, uh, a series. And, uh, well, do you want to uh, Well, uh, we would like to ask, um, do you have any advice and keep yourself motivated or inspired when working on the project? <laughs> what, what stage are you at on this project? Um, we're, we're really early on. We have most of the story and the characters and the relationships and all of that written down. Uh, we're starting to get with the legal parts, uh, but we still don't have... Uh, like an actual script, well, sort of, but we're, we're still in the beginning stages. Yeah, um, and sometimes you find yourself a, a, little, a little disheartened, a little unmotivated, sort of searching for that fuel, is that what you're saying? Yeah, especially yeah. since we're starting, it can be a little scary, or sometimes we don't know like, where to find the correct inspiration. Sure. Um, you know, I talked before about inspiration. Uh, so I went to art school for four years, and I don't entirely know what art is. It's a very confusing concept. But I know that it's adjacent to and meant to elicit feelings. That's the one thing I know for sure. And I've seen a lot of movies where I didn't feel a damn thing except for relief when the credits rolled. The job of art or entertainment is to make you feel something. So whatever the origin of your concept was, your show, whatever it is, at some point it made you feel something. There's a core feeling in there that was your fuel. And you can lose track of that, particularly if you get lots and lots of notes and you say yes to some, all this time goes by in your development, and you're like, why did I even make this? Why did I even do this? And in those times, I find it's very important for me to kind of disconnect a little bit, get everyone's voices out of my ears, and try to find that emotion. Everybody's got different shortcuts to it. But one of mine is listening to music that captures that emotion. So if I'm writing an action script, I listen to the soundtrack of my favorite action movie of all time, and then I remember what it was like to be in the theater, like standing and cheering, I'm like, oh my god, I love action, I forgot, because this process was so hard. Or if the series is um, motivated by a relationship, you think about, oh, how much that relationship meant to you, how much you cared about that person, if the character is a reflection of your mom, or a reflection of, uh, you know, an ex, or a reflection of a teacher who meant so much to you, track it, find it, find that emotion, um, and like I said, for me, the best ways for finding the emotion are, are, are thinking about what the real life 
correlations and combos are, because you feel emotion in your real life. You know, you get cut off in traffic and you, you scream um, and somebody likes one of your posts who you think is cute and your whole day is better, right? Like, try to bottle those, right? Like the fairies in Zelda, like, catch them. Like, they will revive you. Um, that's, that's the best advice I could give. Uh, next question. Hi, it's here in the front. I'm like in front of you. Oh, hello, you're right there. <laughs> I can't get too close because then it'll make this crazy right. noise, so I'll stand right here. Right. So, <laughs> my name is Alice. Hi, Alex. Um, so this is regarding burnout. Uh, taking care of us when we are burned out is like to each other to their own. But being a veteran in the industry, do you have any advice on preventing burnout and taking care of ourselves before we get to that point? I hit burnout hard during the pandemic. I bet a lot of, a, a lot of you did, if any of you are in the industry, or even if not. Um, I think creating, in my experience, is all about finding a good effort to reward ratio, where you put in some work and you see a reward. So you want to make something funny and people laugh, or you want to make something beautiful and people comment on it. And if you're putting in lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of effort and you're not getting a reward, you're not, you're not getting the feedback you want, you're not seeing yourself improve, you're not improving in your career, you will hit burnout. I think burnout often has less to do with time and more to do with unrewarding effort. And suddenly your brain starts to associate effort with lack of reward. And then you're like, boy, if it hurts so bad every single time I jumped off that cliff, why am I gonna do it again, mm -hmm. right? Um, this is a hard question because animation is a very punishing medium. Uh, and the industry is made out of big gears and no face doesn't care if he eats you. Um, you know, I'm still working on that myself. It's really hard. You know, me personally, when I had some really bad burnout, I had the great fortune to be able to take some time off and recuperate. Now, not everybody has that fortune because of money, because of circumstances. Um, you know, I would say that if you don't have the time to take some time off, I'd say, um, I'm trying to think of an answer that doesn't sound like a socialist revolution. One moment. <laughs> you know, I, I'd say that The way, that a human, <laughs> the way that a human properly negotiates a relationship with a non-human entity like a company, the company doesn't know empathy, the company doesn't know fear, but it does know leverage. Um, if multiple workers on a crew are feeling like they're being burned alive and they can't finish this, if they talk to each other, they talk about it, they talk about the salary, and if the project's not unionized, try to unionize. If it can't be unionized, at least that camaraderie and speaking to other people who are on your position can help you realize you're not alone. And simply not feeling alone can sometimes take a little bit of the pressure off of that burnout. Um, so for me, it's, you know, take a break if you can. And sometimes you don't think you can and you can. Now, again, a lot of that's financial. But sometimes your body tells you, I can't anymore. And you think, no, 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 I'm just going to do this anyway. And sometimes you can't. And sometimes it's, it's like, you're working out and you say, I have to keep working out, and then you break an arm, and then you gotta wait a whole year to recover. So sometimes the right timed vacation, even if it causes frustration, can be good in the long run. I'm not the best person to speak to this because I'm so hyper-motivated, and, and I made the same mistake. I ran headlong into something and I hit burnout and I had to take some time off. But, you know, uh, time off, communication, camaraderie with your peers, um, find out what your value is to the project. If you know that they can't fire you, say, Give me a, open the schedule, give me a raise. Because if you know they can't fire you, they will do it. Now, if they can't fire you, they will fire you. So that's uh. why it's important to know your worth. And it changes from project to project and it means it involves a lot of communication. Um, it's really hard out there. I hope, hope, hope that with more voices, with more people in the industry, we get to a point where the companies can't squeeze the blood out of us the way they do right now. Um, but in the meantime, we just have to band together and take breaks when we can. Thank you. All right. Next question. Here. Oh. Here, right here. Oh. Ah. Thank you. Um, I love you. Uh, That's very cute. <laughs> okay. I like that little bunny. Oh, thank you. He's Hector. Um, I like her. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I want you to know. Bueno, I want to know uh, how many times you give in a screen um, a place uh, when you're writing a story. How how you can work boldly. 
world building. The world building. How, how do I approach world building? Um, you know, there's a reason that my short, short talk had words like fear and inspiration in them. Uh, because I really do believe that if an artist is a car, emo emotion is the fuel. Um, and whenever I'm lost, I have to follow the North Star, star of Emotion. So on Gravity Falls, for example, I don't know if any of you have ever been to Oregon. There are not redwoods in Oregon. <laughs> Gravity Falls lied to you. Um, why would I do that? Why would I put redwoods in a state that canonically in real life has no redwoods? Because I approach world building and locations emotionally. So I had a diff bunch of different experiences growing up. When I was a kid, me and my great aunt Lois, we called her Granty Lois, she insisted on it. Us and Granty Lois, we would go to this, this camping lodge in California that had redwoods and it was beautiful. And as a kid, I thought, God, there's something so mysterious and magical about this place. I wish I could live here. I, I, I wish there was adventures here. And it stayed in my brain. Um, years later, my sophomore year of college, I did an internship at Leica Studios in Oregon. And I went whitewater rafting and I went hiking and I thought, oh my God, I love Oregon. It feels remote and lawless and creative and strange. And these emotions were powerful in me. And so me, when I see redwoods, I think about my time with my great aunt Lois. And when I see big cliffs and waterfalls, I think about my time in Oregon. So I just jammed them together. I said, what makes me feel the most? Now sometimes this would drive my poor art director, Ian, crazy, because he's an extraordinary artist. And then I'd look at the mystery shack and I'd say, it has to have an A-frame like a barn. And he'd say, why? And I'd be like, because I stayed at a place with an A-frame as an after-school program when I was a kid, and I played Nintendo in the attic, and so attics are magical to me for some reason, so I need you to put an attic in Oregon with redwoods. Doesn't make any logical sense, but it makes emotional sense. And as long as I followed that emotion, I've honestly, out of the like millions of comments I've gotten, whether it's letters or tweets or uh, conventions, maybe one out of a thousand people have said, why the hell are there redwoods in Oregon? Instead, everyone says, this feels like my childhood because I was being emotionally truthful, so they recognized it. So that would be my advice. All right, next oh, question. Who do hello. we got? Hello, over here. Hi. Um, in the middle part, over here. <laughs> Everyone is pointing to their friend as if to say, pick on them next. I'm trying to find you. There you are. Okay. Right yeah. in the center, here wearing a gray, non-distinctive. <laughs> you okay. blend right in. Uh, what's your question? You. I want to ask you about your own experience because uh, I feel like most of the people in here are 20 something year olds. And like personally, when the show the show aired, I was 12 year old, so I grew up Perfect. the same age as Deeper and Mabel. And it's really surreal just to experience the show and just being able to literally put yourself in the place of the characters. How does it feel to you as a creator to see this generation just being shaped by something you made? It's, oh, oops, sorry. It's, uh, it's extraordinarily rewarding and surreal. Um, when we first started working at the Disney Channel, um, that was like the Hannah Montana era. It was like a very different era. Uh, and they weren't making anything like our show. Um, they had Phineas and Ferb, which was very great and funny. Um, but they were coming out of this era where they were just making kind of like cheap replicas of their movies. It's like Hercules, the animated series. I'm sure people worked very hard on it. Maybe it's great. Maybe I'm wrong. But there wasn't like, there wasn't stuff that felt personal. There wasn't a lot of stuff that felt personal on the channel. And um, I was so excited to get the opportunity. I was like, I have to make this. I have to make it. But this channel is so different from the stuff I make. I don't know if an audience will ever find it. I didn't know if uh, necessarily if a Hannah Montana fan would want to see a pantsless old man saying, no refunds. Like, I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know if they'd want to see continuity. There were no animated comedies with half hour continuity at the time. You know, now, in the decades since, there's tons of them. Um, and some of them are incredible. Um, shows with, you know, but that didn't exist at the time. So I, we really kind of thought, we're going to make this, we're going to learn from it. No one will ever watch it. It will be buried on the channel. We'll move on, and it will be like a training exercise. We're still like, we're going to give it all, everything we got. And we had no idea that people would like it then. Certainly no idea that people would like it now. I, I, I have friends whose children think the show is currently running. 
Every day I get a tweet saying, when's season three? Because people don't know that it, season two ended six years ago. Um, I, I don't entirely know what to credit that longevity for other than that thing I said about listening to your friends. You know, we had so much talent in our team and we listened to them. So when people would say this isn't working, we'd try to fix it. And if that many talented people think something's working and if they're honest with you, it might stand the test of time. Um, I think sometimes the things that don't stand the test of time, no one ever said, tell me why this sucks and help me fix it. Um, I think that's part of it. But no, I'm, I'm incredibly grateful. It's super weird. Uh, I'm very happy. I still don't believe it. I don't take it for granted. Any day, people might just decide it's dumb and they hate it, and I'd be like, fair enough. We did our best. <laughs> but I'm very, very happy people are still discovering it. And thanks to Disney+, Plus, people are finding it for the first time. Oh, I should mention something here before I forget. I, I, I hate, like, trying to sell stuff, but if, if you're the type of fan who would care, this is important. Um, we made Gravity Falls uh, DVDs and Blu-rays with commentary and all these special features. We were really lucky. Disney doesn't normally do that. I don't know. Whoever the boss was was, like, sleeping at the button, and they let it happen. I don't know why they let it happen. <laughs> but, like, that person finally woke up and just canceled the license. So um, the company that makes the Gravity Falls DVDs and Blu-rays is n officially no longer allowed to make any more. So the ones that are on sale now are the last ones that exist. And probably in a couple of months, all of them will be gone. So if anyone is a fan who has wanted something like that, now would be the time to get it because they, they will be gone. Um, but they're all on Disney+, Plus. but the DVD's got awesome commentary. Really funny stuff. Uh, 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 really talented creators on that commentary. So if you can get a hold of it, I recommend it. But it will be gone soon. Um, all right, next question. Thank you. Hi, Alex. Um, I'm here. <laughs> uh, I found you fast. So, first of all, thanks for being here in Mexico and thanks for being a part of my life because Gravity Falls is a very um, important series that I love. But keeping up with my question, how do you come up with these creative characters like Bill Cipher, that even though it's a very simple character, it's very unique and a lot of people love him. Um, thanks. Yeah, so probably when you're watching the show and you see a, a triangle show up and be like, buy gold, it just seems like nonsense. You're like, Who, where does this come from? It seems like it comes from nowhere. It seems like it comes from someone who's crazy. <laughs> There's a logic to it. Um, I don't know if any of you sat in on, I, I've been lucky enough to be here and see wonderful talks from my friends, uh, Matt Brawley's talk and Dana Terrace's talk. Um, in both of those talks, they talk about how when you're creating a show, the most important thing is the characters, their philosophies, their relationships to each other. So then how do you design side characters? Well, the job of a side character is to bring something out of the main character, right? So if your main character is a stuffy aristocrat who always has their pinky up and has 13 different forks and has never interacted with somebody else, you need them to interact with a grimy hillbilly. That will pull something out of them. If your character is a rageaholic, you need them to interact with the calmest person in the world. It'll probably make them even angrier, angrier until they learn something. Dipper was the most paranoid guy in the world who wanted answers more than anyone. So who would drive a guy crazy who wants answers? We worked backwards from that and we said, oh, Someone who has all the answers teases them and then doesn't give him the answers. It seems random, but it's what Dipper needed. It's the thing that would drive Dipper insane. Um, now, the idea of it being a triangle, I mean, this is where I think um, me and my friend Mike, uh, who I've mentioned, who did Mitchell's versus the Machines and was a creative director on Gravity Falls, we have this saying we always use, which is we love, we think the best work in, in, in our taste is a great mixture between observation and invention. If something is all invention with no observation, it'll be random and no one will care. If it's all observation with no invention, it's a documentary and that's cool, but that's not what I came here to make. So I think the observation with Bill was when I was 12 and I thought I was a know-it-all, would, it would make me crazy to have somebody with answers teasing me. And then the invention was, all right, well, it's a show about mysteries. What are all the conspiracies? Okay, Illuminati's a conspiracy. You do a little bit of research and you realize it's nothing. People just fall for stuff really easy. But you know, it's got that triangle on the back of the dollar bill. So I'm like, triangle, bill, boom. <laughs> it just suddenly happens that way. So, you know, half observation, half invention, and also just goofing around. I did the voice for my friends. It made them laugh. And I was like, if they like it, I'm keeping it. Oh, we're yeah. running out of time? We're out of time. No problem. I'm sorry. I guess that, that was the last question. <laughs> Thank you.
Uh, th thank you all so much for coming. This was wonderful. I, I haven't done one of these since the pandemic, and like I said, I had some burnout, so seeing all of your inspiration lifts me up, takes me out of my fear hole. I really appreciate it. Um, I'll be here for the rest of the day. I will say, if you see me, Sometimes if you run up and take a picture, then it'll turn into like a, like a pile up and then I'll get trapped. So, you know, maybe just chill. But I, I love taking pictures, but it, it sometimes get, it gets crazy. But I love you all. I wish I could take a picture with every single one of you, so I'll do it right now with my phone. One second. Por favor, no se paren sobre las sillas. Oh, you, you do it first. With your foot? Oh, ju ju yeah, I got it. Okay, one, two, three. And now the selfie.